Okay, welcome everybody. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge that we're on the traditional territory of the Lenape and Wappinger peoples. So please join me in honoring them, both past and present, and recognizing that our presence here today is founded on the exclusions and erasures of many indigenous peoples. My name is Mitch Bernard. Uh, I'm the interim president at NRDC, the Natural Resources Defense Council, and it's my pleasure to introduce today's panel discussion on the impact that um, our demand for throwaway products is having on Canada's boreal forest. Over the last year, the international scientific community has underscored the essential role that our world's intact forests must play in our efforts to avoid the most catastrophic impacts of climate change. Unfortunately, the threats facing these forests have never been greater. We have all seen the devastating situation in Brazil, where fires threaten the Amazon rainforest as we know it, underscoring the importance of protecting uh, forests everywhere we can. What's less well known are the threats facing the largest intact forest in the world, which is the Canadian boreal forest. Canada's boreal forest is the largest terrestrial carbon store in the world. Its trees and soils store nearly twice as much carbon as the burning of the world's combined oil reserves would generate. Protecting this great forest's ability to keep this carbon in the ground must be a critical component of our global climate strategy. Unfortunately, rather than a concerted effort to support the resiliency of Canada's boreal forest, industrial activities are instead undermining its health. Every year, more than one million acres of Canada's boreal forest are clear cut. This has given Canada the, the dubious distinction of having lost more intact forest than any country other than Russia or Brazil. This logging takes place in the heart of many indigenous communities' lands, and it consumes a rich biodiverse ecosystem that provides habitat for mammals like the boreal caribou and the Canada lynx, as well as billions of migratory North American songbirds. The reality is that much of this logging is driven by U.S. demand. 80% of boreal wood product exports go to the United States, ending up in our books, our homes, our furniture, and perhaps most absurdly, our toilet paper. No intact forest should be clear cut for single use throwaway products, particularly a product that the typical person likely spends next to no time thinking about. NRDC has been leading an effort to draw attention to the alarming tree to toilet pipeline. In February, we, we released a report called The Issue with Tissue, which identified the major toilet paper brands that still use 100% virgin forest fiber, as well as those that have turned to alternate materials like recycled content and agricultural residue. Corporate buyers in the United States need to fully reckon with their own environmental footprints and think about what true leadership in this domain really means. This panel will discuss what's happening on the ground in the boreal forest of Canada, show how U.S. companies are driving intact forest loss, and highlight key ways that major buyers of virgin forest fiber can lead by supporting indigenous-led land management and transforming their supply chains toward more circular and constructive solutions. So now to introduce our esteemed panelists, um, we're bringing together leaders and experts who will provide a variety of perspectives on the threats facing the boreal, as well as innovative strategies for protecting the forest and its many values for indigenous peoples, biodiversity, and the climate. On the far end, I'd like to introduce Deputy Grand Chief Mandy Gull of the Cree Nation. She served as Deputy Chief of her home community, the Cree First Nation of Waswanapi, before being elected to her current role. 
As deputy chief in her prior role, prior role, Mandy represented her home community in its efforts to protect its last intact forests, including the Broadback River Valley. As deputy grand chief, the position she now holds, Mandy serves as chairman of the EU Land Use Planning Commission, she's a member of the Justice Committee, and she leads the Cree Quebec Table on Environment and Protected Areas. She's been a tireless voice for protecting the Cree territory from industrial development and has been working across the Cree communities and using groundbreaking mapping systems to establish protected areas that safeguard the territory's wildlife and secure the Cree way of life. Um, and just to mention that Mandy is joined by her protected areas coordinator, Chantal Tetreau, who is with us also. Next, we have Michael Altman, uh, the senior retention marketing manager for, I kid you not, who gives a crap toilet paper, who gives a crap makes forest friendly products that delight the consumer and are good for the world. They are leading the toilet paper industry by offering toilet paper made without any virgin forest fiber. Started in 2013, their mission is to offer a sustainable product that satisfies consumers. And in addition, and it's very noteworthy, who gives a crap donates 50% of its profits to help build toilets and improve sanitation in the developing world. We are further joined next to me by Jeff Wells, who is a leading expert on the boreal forest ecosystem. Dr. Wells is the vice president of boreal conservation for the National Audubon Society. Before arriving at Audubon, he was the science and policy director for the Boreal Songbird Initiative and the chief science advisor to the International Boreal Conservation Campaign. He did that for 15 years. Dr. Wells is an active speaker and writer, having penned hundreds of papers, op-eds, reports, articles, columns, blogs, and a number of books, including Boreal Birds of North America, which was published in 2011. He earned his PhD and uh, master's degrees from Cornell University in ecology and evolutionary biology. Last but by no means least is Tsipora Berman, the international program director at Stan.Earth. Tsipora has been designing and winning campaigns in Canada and internationally for 25 years. In addition to her current role as international program director at Stand, Tsipora serves as a strategic advisor for dozens of environmental organizations, First Nations, and philanthropists on clean energy, oil sands, and pipelines. She is the former co-director of Greenpeace International's Climate and Energy Program and co-founder of Forest Ethics. In 2019, Ms. Berman received the Climate Breakthrough Project Award, and in 2013, she was awarded an honorary doctorate from the University of British Columbia. So I now finally get to introduce my valued colleague, Shelley Vineyard, who, will, um, who is the co-author of the issue with tissue and perhaps the source of the title of that report. Are you? Yes. The source of the very clever title to that report. And uh, Shelley will now moderate the panel. So thank you all for attending. Thank you, Mitch. Um, yes, I'm uh, NRDC's Boreal Corporate Campaign Manager, and um, I want to thank you all for coming and thank the, this excellent um, bench of panelists for um, joining me to talk about this issue today. Um, before I uh, begin our discussion with our panelists, I did want to take a minute just to share a little bit of context behind our campaign and why, why we're doing this. Um, as Mitch described, uh, the current situation in the boreal has become untenable, uh, both for the climate and for the ecological integrity of the forest. And um, it's unsustainable logging that is uh, fueling that dynamic, and it's largely driven by the international marketplace. And so when we were um, 
figuring out how to best uh, affect direct change on the ground and uh, protections, uh, we realized that we, we needed to engage the international marketplace in order to um, create the leverage points to uh, make change possible in Canada. And so we started examining what were all the products that Boreal Wood was ending up in and the most shocking was toilet paper. Um, and, you know, when I, I feel like when environmental organizers and activists are shocked by something, that's an indicator that probably the rest of the public doesn't know about it and needs to. So we worked with STAND. We co-wrote a report, the issue with tissue that we released back in February with the intention of bringing to uh, the public the public's attention, educating consumers, educating um, institutions that purchase tissue, tissue products, and um, urging large, the largest tissue manufacturers to produce products that are made in a way that supports our global efforts to protect uh, the climate and preserve biodiversity. Um, since we released the report, the campaign has really taken on a life of its own. Uh, 180,000 people have signed petitions calling on Procter & Gamble to um, change its sourcing and make toilet paper that is um, made from more sustainable sources. Um, two, we've gotten more than 200 media hits. Dozens of groups have joined our call to action um, and millions of consumers have engaged our, uh, on our campaign over social media. And uh, it's clear now that this is an issue that people were, are clamoring to know about, and it's really resonated. And it was, that was true in February. I think it's even more true today. Um, people are, uh, uh, people really agree with the idea that we can no longer um, afford to use our intact forests for throwaway products, when, especially when there are more uh, reasonable alternatives um, out there. So. Without further ado, um, I do want to begin our discussion um, and uh, bring together all of these experts um, whose backgrounds are very different, but how all share the same goal. And so um, with that, I'm gonna ask Mandy uh, our first question. So um, Mandy, you have been long been a champion for uh, better protection measures for the boreal from industrial disturbance. And you've represented the Cree Nation um, as a staunch advocate for environmental stewardship and the Cree way of life. Um, can you speak about the, the boreal's importance for the Cree way of life? And can you also share how the forest industry has uh, changed the Cree's lands? Okay. So what I said was, first I'd like to extend my thanks to the audience members for attending today's panel, and my thanks for being invited to be a part of this panel, and I also acknowledge the traditional territories in which we've been received in today. Um, to answer the question, I think I need to give a little bit of detail about who the Cree Nation is. So we are a nation of Aboriginal people consisting of 10 communities from Northern Quebec, or roughly 20,000 members. And we are probably, I would have to say, one of the most unique Aboriginal groups in Canada because we founded a landmark um, a landmark agreement known as the James Bay and Northern Quebec Agreement. And this was you know, something that occurred when they announced the hydro development pr project of the century, where, you know, Quebec decided that they were going to develop the north and develop hydroelectric projects, and we pursued uh, an injunction against that, and after litigation and all kinds of things, uh, we were able to, to win an agreement uh, with Quebec and with Hydro-Quebec to recognize our rights as, in, as individuals in inheriting the territory, that these were our traditional territories. So, 
you know, starting from having an impact of hydroelectric development in the north and later seeing other industry coming into the territory and changing the landscape of the Cree, um, I think that we've, we've been very impacted. I am from the most southern community, the community of Waswanapi, and we have been heavily impacted by forestry. So the way our traditional territory is organized is in trap lines. So every family has a tallyman who's charged with being the steward of his trap line. He oversees the hunting, the trapping, the fishing activities, the wildlife habitats. His role is to have dialogue and consultation for, you know, for a variety of items. But we were one of the few indigenous groups in Canada where we were heavily affected by forestry and we sued because it impacted our way of life. And we were able to create a system where we are involved in the consultation process for forestry, which is very unique from other First Nations. Our neighboring nation, the Algonquin Nation, right now is in a battle against the provincial government because they've launched a campaign regarding the state of the moose that they are not able to harvest moose in a healthy way. The moose population is not only severely ill, but the numbers have dwindled fairly low, so they've been heavily impacted. I think for us in the Cree territory, our relationship with the boreal not only changes from the southern to the northern portion, we also um, are impacted by by issues relating to wildlife living in the forest. For us, one of the big things, one of the hot topic items is the woodland caribou living in the Cree territory. Um, our dialogue in developing protected areas with the government of Quebec, we're, we're one of the unique groups that have a specific table set aside for us to have discussions on the environment and protected area. We have been talking about the woodland caribou and the impact on this animal and its habitat. So. One of the first things that I think I can really call attention to is the fact that, you know, large game like moose and caribou really sustain our way of life, our hunting practices, everything, our food sources. So their habitat and environment is essential. And when industry comes in and disturbs that and even destroys that in some cases, in a sense, you're having an impact on the people. So for us... Our relationship with the boreal is everything. The Cree way of life, it is the boreal forest. We're forest dwelling Aboriginals, First Nations. So it's it's really key that, you know, we continue working on trying to not only bring that message to the forefront of industry, but also really showcase that there is a way to engage First Nations in healthy discussions and trying to manage the boreal. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. Um, I, I also want to ask Zipporah, um, your experience as a Canadian and as one of the most uh, well-respected environmental activists and organizers in Canada, um, you've been in the trenches fighting for the climate and for the boreal for many years. Um, why do you think protecting the boreal is such an important fight today? Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. And thank you to NRDC for organizing uh, this event at Climate Week. You know, part of the conversation about why the boreal imp is important today is linked to what we're doing here at Climate Week. Uh, the fact is, you know, we're here at a moment in time when the world is on fire. This summer, we saw fires from the Arctic to the Amazon, and fires are increasing, of course, in the boreal as well. We have so little forest left uh, to maintain ecosystem integrity. And it is uh, uh, ensuring greater protection uh, of the boreal um, is linked to ensuring a stable climate, ensuring that we have the air we breathe and the water we drink. The boreal is literally a, a, a green halo um, that, that that is, uh, covers the top of the earth. It's, um, as Shelley mentioned, one of the largest forests uh, that are left on earth. Um, and it's disappearing so quickly. It was shocking to me um, uh, when uh, Stand uh, joined uh, NRDC's campaign to hear where we're at in the boreal, because as some of you in this room know, um, I spent many years um, trying to create a campaign on the boreal decades ago. and. Um, I um, left the campaign to work on uh, climate issues in oil and gas for many years. 
And I came back after 10 years of not working on forest issues. And the first meeting I had with Shelley and Anthony and others, I was just completely horrified. Because after, when I left, there was an agreement to put a moratorium on logging caribou habitat across the country, to work jointly with indigenous nations and scientists and the industry and environmental groups to try and ensure protection of critical endangered species habitat and to make sure that the logging that did happen uh, was responsible and not in critical areas. And what I found out after being gone for 10 years um, was that that process had mostly collapsed because the logging industry just continued to log in critical caribou habitat. And that's really important, not just because of the caribou, but because these are um, species that have an enormous impact, obviously, um, and a human rights impact on indigenous way of life as they disappear, but also because they're a focal species. They're, a, they're the canary in the coal mine for the boreal. And their decline is signifying the, the health of that ecosystem as a whole. So it was mentioned already that the, the, the boreal um, holds a, an enormous amount of carbon, 306 billion tons of carbon, actually. Um, and it stores more carbon, actually, than any other forest type on Earth, except mangroves. And, and, and as the landscape and soils get disturbed, this carbon is getting released. There have been shocking reports from scientists in the last year saying that the boreal may be coming a net emitter instead of a sink of carbon because of how quickly our climate is changing. Our children are scared and they're marching in the streets. Four million people marched in the streets this week because they're concerned about climate change. And we're allowing major disturbances in one of the most important places on earth to keep our climate safe in order to make toilet paper. The idea that we even need to sit here today and have this discussion is absurd. A lot of people talk about what a tragedy it is, what's happening in the boreal, the fires, and, and, and now it's emitting carbon. And it's not a tragedy, it's a scandal. Because a tragedy is something that can't be fixed. A scandal is something where you have the tools to fix it, but decision makers are not acting. So the Canadian government knows that the caribou are disappearing, and we actually have laws in Canada, supposedly, to ensure that they are protected, endangered species legislation. So what the Canadian government could be putting in place recovery plans. And companies like Procter & Campbell could be making decisions to not buy unless those recovery plans for species are put in place. And logging companies in Canada could make better decisions about where they log. But those things aren't happening, and I think they'll only happen if we continue to raise awareness and if companies like Procter & Gamble, who have a global reach, make a decision to take a stand about where their paper comes from. Thank you. Um, and I think it's, um, yeah, it, it is so absurd that we even have to sit here today. And I, I wanted to turn to Jeff Wells. You spoke about how scientists um, have been calling for um, more protection of the boreal for years. And Jeff has been one of the scientists leading that fight. Um, so th thank you for being here, Jeff. I'd love to hear from you. Um, you know, you have used your research to advocate for really important solutions. And I'd love to hear from you first, um, why did you decide that, to focus your efforts on the boreal, um, on the boreal forest of Canada? What was going, what's going on there that um, you think needs, needs your, needed your attention? Yes, sure. Thank you, um, Shelley, and thank you everybody for, for being here for NRDC. Uh, also uh, for sponsoring this event. Um, a little over 15 years ago, I, was, uh, I had been working in, in conservation and in, in mostly in the US and um, some, somehow somebody put in front of me a, a, a striking map. It was a map that showed the last large intact forest, uh, forests on earth um, the places that in, you know, when you think about it, in the course of human evolutionary history, these are the last places in the course of human evolutionary history on Earth that had never been cut over. 
and there were there were five of them, and one of the the largest of those is what we've heard here is is the Canadian boreal forest. Most people in even in Canada, you know, don't think about that. Certainly in the U.S., I haven't thought about that. You know, imagine that there is this last place left um, that we have a chance. These are the last chances for us to do something different than we've done everywhere else. And so, you know, seeing that, seeing that there was this opportunity to do something different and do um, apply the science that we've been we've been um, working on all these years, the conservation science that told us what we need to do to maintain habitats, to maintain species, to maintain ecosystems and ecological function. This is a place where that could potentially be done. And that's what really kind of inspired me. It's the last chance in my generation, our generation, to actually do this. This is the last, those of us that are here today, this is their last chance, you know. It's, it's going to change over the next generation one way or another. As I learned more about it and became working specifically in it professionally, I started to learn more about all the, the conservation values of the forest. You know, the fact we did some work modeled um, an estimate that there were one, between one and three billion birds that nest across the boreal forest. Most of those birds spill out across the hemisphere in this, this wave that's passing over New York and, and you know, all across the United States right now as we speak, as they're migrating south to become the winter birds of places from South America uh, through the United States. Um, water resources, some of the largest freshwater lakes on Earth, most surface freshwater, the largest wetlands, peatlands. We've heard about the carbon, the largest, some of the largest carbon stores on the planet. Just amazing biodiversity and ecological features. And then at the same time, as we started... Uh, looking at the connections to things like birds that come to the U.S., we started to look more into the, the factors that were impacting the future of the boreal and, and those birds. And one of the biggest ones, of course, is, 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 uh, is logging in, in the forest industry. And I used to say the people when I'd give bird talks down here in the U.S., when you look out your back window and you see... A, a white-throated sparrow or a dark-eyed junco under your feeder in the winter, uh, and then you know you you turn to pick up the spills on your counter. Do you ever think where that paper towel you just ripped off came from? You know that you could be enjoying this bird from the boreal forest and yet helping to kill it in a sense if you choose the wrong product. You know at 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 the same moment, and so trying to make people understand those connections became one of the biggest things we wanted to work on um, and to start educating people about it, about those connections and starting working with others in coalition to see if we could uh, change, change that, that model and that pattern. One of the other big, outside of all of the energy that's been um, directed towards solving the addressing climate change over this last week was the news that North America has lost a third of its bird population. Um, and as somebody who grew up um, as a, in a birding household, um, I was heartbroken. Um, how, how is climate change interconnected with that news? Yeah, I'm sure. I, I I can't believe any of you haven't seen the news about that. Um, if you if you have missed it somehow, you had to be in a in a remote place because it's been all over the news. Yeah, there's three billion birds fewer now than there were in 1970, uh, well documented in a paper in Science. Um, so yeah, it was a you know a, a a stab to the to the heart sort of that everybody who cares about the natural world has, has been hearing, and a large number of those actually are are boreal birds too. So um, we know that a lot of the factors are are issues that happen on the wintering grounds and um, in on migration. But we also know that the especially in the southern boreal that has been hardest hit by uh, forestry. There's probably many of the the losses from that as well. Um, but we also know that climate change is drastically um, affecting these these birds in many ways, from um, causing droughts in the western part of the boreal, uh, increasing fire frequency and and size of fires, all sorts of different sort uh, kinds of effects that are changing um, bird populations. Birds 
are also sort of starting to move move north into the boreal. And so, you know, the boreals, this this uh, sort of huge carbon reservoir, um, and we talk about protecting the, the landscapes from um, impacts, as Sapora said, that help release that carbon, um, but also as a place that helps these wildlife populations, birds and other wildlife, um, maintain populations that are going to be resilient to climate change as they're pushed and pulled around uh, from all the, the impacts that we're, that we're seeing. These are going to be the places that give them the best chances for survival into the future. Well, you spoke about how um, learning about the last intact places on the earth included the boreal and why, how that drew you to um, your work. Um, I want to turn to Mike Altman with Who Gives a Crap? Because um, when we released our report in February, uh, one of the things that was really notable was the number of people who responded to our social media saying that they used Who Gives a Crap. And uh, when we saw that, we reached out to one of your co-founders, Danny Alexander, and discovered that um, you offer toilet paper made from 100% post-consumer recycled content, which is the highest percentage we've encountered by far at any at, for any at-home tissue brand. Um, and I've heard Danny say that he feels really strongly that trees shouldn't be used to make toilet paper. Um, and I'm curious your thoughts about why... Um, you know, why it is that the tissue industry status quo relies on intact forests, and um, why, why does Who Gives a Crap believe that that shouldn't be the case? Well, thank you, Shelley, and thanks NRDC for having me today to speak um, with such an esteemed panel. Um, Sephora mentioned something earlier, is that um, this is all kind of absurd, and I think when we started Who Gives a Crap, we felt that it is absurd that people wipe their rears with virgin trees. Like, how? Like how? how um, and I think part of it is that we've all, a lot of people, our consumers have been asleep and they're waking up. And they're waking up to see that um, we've been marketed to by companies that distract us from where the products come from. This similar has been going on in the food industry for years. And you've been seeing that all of the marketing is going towards that. And the response from the companies um, are constantly saying, well, our consumers don't want that or they don't care. Um, they won't buy eco-friendly products um, that people will use. And our question to those companies is, well, well we want to make products, eco-friendly products that people do want to use, that are fun and delightful and, e and easy um, and convenient. So I think that... Um, it does, I mean, in, in the report, a lot of um, it, it mentions, uh, you know, companies taking some steps forward to have some percentage of um, post-consumable um, recyclables in their products. Um, but I actually found it interesting that it wasn't 100%. Like, we're at a point where we need to go there and that our consumers want us to go there. Um, so, you know, we, we try to make things simple. So we're going to go 100%, right? We, we said we, we, we donate 50% of our profits to help build toilets around the world. I think that maybe we just like even numbers. Um, maybe, but I think that on our journey, this is about uh, telling a simple story and allowing people to wake up because the, the need is there and people want these products. Yeah, it, whenever I talk to you all, I'm, I'm always encouraged about the, um, the news you share about consumer demand. Um, and you you said that consumers are waking up, uh, and I think that that is um, a good transition to hearing a little bit more about what um, you all are doing, what all of our panelists are doing to protect um, intact forests and intact forests in the boreal um, right now. And so I, I, I want to go back to Zipporah. Um, I'm hoping you can share a bit about... Um, Dan's track record of corporate campaigning to protect intact forests and how you're using your experience to make progress today. Uh, sure, thanks, Shelley. Um, 
it, you know, for for now, I over two decades, I think, um, we first started looking at what is the role of customers in the marketplace in forest loss in the early 90s, um, focusing on temperate rainforests on the West Coast. Um, and we started, and in part it was because the science was very clear uh, already then, in the early 90s, um, that the impact and the pace of logging in intact forests was having a devastating impact on ecosystem services. Um, and there was already, it was already extremely um, uh, clear uh, that there was a lot of popular support uh, for greater protection. You know, at the time there were blockades, you know, people referred to it now as, as the war in the woods, you know, um, thousands of people were um, arrested. Uh, and local communities and blockading rainforests. And, um, but the logging just kind of continued. And, and so that led us um, to having a, a discussion about, so why? Uh, why is this logging continuing, even though the public would support greater conservation and different logging practices? The science supports it. You know, who's calling the shots, really? And to trying to do a power analysis. And, and, and what that was the early days of what's now known as markets campaigns. You know, basically tracing, where's the money? Um, and what we found out then was that we could trace uh, the logging and the demand for the logging right back to the products, which is what um, NRDC um, has done in this campaign with Stand and what we did together uh, on the west coast of Canada on temperate rainforests. So we started following, back then we didn't have the internet, that's how old I am. <laughs> so we, we actually had to follow logging trucks to mills and then, and, then, and then take mill tours and say, and who buys it? You know, oh, Home Depot, thank you. <laughs> um, and, and we would, we literally uh, started, you know, bought our first suits and went and met with Home Depot and Scott Paper and, and various people that we heard were buying from it. At the time, the Yellow Pages. Remember Yellow Pages? There were phone books and... And they were, um, and and we went and met with the companies. And the companies similar said um, 20 years ago uh, a lot of what we've heard from Procter and Gamble today. They said it's not our problem. Talk to your governments. We just buy it. Um, they said we're being told that what we buy is sustainable, and that species are protected. None of those things are true. They weren't true 20 years ago, and they weren't, and they aren't true today. Um, but it's that's what. Um, uh, the logic um, be behind continuing to buy. What's different today than what happened 20 years ago is that then we didn't even have notions of corporate social responsibility. We didn't have social media campaigns. We didn't have engagement the way that we have today. And, and so companies are being held to a higher count, account for, of sustainability today than they were before. Um, and responsibility, and that's good. Um, and that also means the campaigns are easier and more successful. So you can mark my words, Procter & Gamble will do the right thing eventually, because they have to now. The world is changing very quickly. So what we do at Stand is we have a research group in-house, we trace products from the ground, from who's logging, who's buying it, who's processing it, and, um, and who's buying it. And then we go and meet with buyers, um, often in coalition like we are right now with NRDC, and we give them the opportunity to do the right thing. Here are your options. Other fibers, recycled fibers from places, um, you know, for a stewardship council fiber, et cetera. And that's what we've done with Procter & Gamble. Um, and then if they refuse to do the right thing, um, then we make sure that we're doing everything we can in the way that environmental groups should, which is telling the public what's happening. We like to do it in inventive ways at Stand. Um, we're now the proud owners of very large inflatable toilet paper rolls and, um, you know, 60-foot inflatable bears that look like Charmin that hold chainsaws. Um, because in those creative ways, we can engage people and we can engage the company and we can engage the media to tell the story. Because environmental groups don't have multi-million dollar ad um, budgets. They just don't. Um, but we do... Um, have an enormous amount of support, and we are really creative. Um, and we're going to keep using those methods 
both at their AGMs, through finance campaigns, in talking to company shareholders, in making sure um, we're in front of their storefronts or in their stores and talking to their senior management. And what happens in these campaigns is the issue becomes a problem that they need to solve. And until the issue becomes a problem that they need to solve, they won't act because they'll buy the cheapest thing or the thing um, that is easiest. And um, everyone today, given the state of our planet, has a responsibility. And if you're buying billions of dollars of forest products, you have a responsibility more than others. And also a tremendous amount of power to make change. And so, you know, I like to think we're trying to empower the corporations we're working with and challenging to make the change um, that they need. And actually studies show that that will help them. It will help them in the long term as they move to more environmentally responsible um, uh, practices um, by retaining their employees. Um, because um, people want to work these days somewhere that shares the values that they hold and that is addressing the issues that keep them up at night. Thanks. Um, I think... Um, you know, in many ways, who gives a crap is a, is a model for how tissue companies should be operating. And um, Mike, I'm interested, you know, Zipporah talked a little bit about um, how, the, how people's um, prioritization of climate change is, is increasing really rapidly. Um, how are you seeing... Uh, consumer demand change right now? And how has Who Gives a Crap kind of tapped into that? Yeah, it's it's been an interesting journey. We started in Australia and we've been in, uh, in the US now for a few years and as well as the UK and shipping to other parts of Europe. And we've seen that um, one, just um, education about products are different in different places, but there is a, like, a common thread of people who want to buy products that are forest friendly, um, whether it be tissues or toilet paper or kitchen roll paper towels. Um, when I speak to some of our customers, a common, uh, a common thread is that they were looking for a small thing to make a change, right? Um, and there are Facebook groups all around the world of people gathering Obviously, people are gathering on the streets. There are people's, like, as we mentioned, children, but people gathering, talking about word of mouth, recommending. Oh, what do you use to? You know, what what are you doing to to make a change? And people are talking about our products, and that's and that's where this is happening. You know, obviously, we do also you know traditional uh, um, advertising, um, but it's there is um, people want to talk about it. So we we make our product really easy to talk about. Obviously, the name, but. Um, mm -hmm. Also, we make it really beautiful. We, we make our customers want to display it in their home. And um, when people visit, it's a topic of conversation. Um, and it, it, and it, it immediately makes it easier to talk about because it starts with, I'm doing something to change what's happening. Um, you know, we're all talking about the climate this week. Um, and so when you're in your home and it, and it comes up and you come from the bathroom, oh, what was that toilet paper in there? Right? And we... we our customers are 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 already the, are the hero, right? This is an, a badge, right? Or even a cape. Um, you know, I don't recommend wearing our tissue, you know, our toilet paper as a cape. I mean, you could It'd be kind of fun, but um, it, it's a symbol uh, of I stand for something. Um, and people use products like that, right? We're not the first company for people to do that all the time. With our purchasing decisions, we're making a statement about what we stand for, um, and so. When we make it easy to tell our our, our rolls are uh, our wrappings on our rolls are very colorful, um, and they have funny stayings on them, and we make it um, we make it fun. Uh, we make it fun to say that I'm doing something really good for the environment. So um, we it doesn't have to be um, it it doesn't have to be hard. And so people are looking for these smaller things that they can do, um, and we also make it really easy. Um, so generally, what, what I think the the consumer de demand is changing, um, and it's taking time. But as I mentioned before, people are are getting on board. Great, I love that making the consumer the hero. Um, well, you know, I, I do think you're right that people are clamoring for ways to um, clamoring to identify solutions, and I, I think the work that Mandy, you've been 
doing um, to um, establish indigenous-led land management plans in Cree territory is a solution that should be promoted um, far beyond Canada. And I know you, you were on a panel this morning um, speaking about it, and I um, wanted to ask you um, to talk a little bit about that and, um, and the work you're doing and also the interconnection between um, climate change and indigenous-led land management. Thank you. Um, first of all, I think that um, one of the things for me, like in your last question, is realizing that there's a common awakening, I think, of just mankind, of, you know what, oh, something is going on here. And I think it's kind of occurring, too, in the First Nations space where we are starting. We always knew that the traditional knowledge that we had about our territories was very unique and special. But for me, I think really starting to awaken and realize the impact of how we share that information and how we showcase the processes that we've been undertaking in the Cree Nation is, is something of value and notable to, to share with everybody, not just with indigenous people, but you know, with other groups throughout on an international scale. But the work that we've been doing in the Cree territory, we've, we have been fighting forestry and the impact of forestry in our region for over 20 years. And I had, and I can honestly say this, up until three years ago, I was so concerned with the tree being cut down that I never thought about what I was buying. So I too was guilty of wiping my counter with the paper towel. And I never really thought of that until I had been invited uh, to speak at a fashion panel where they talked about viscous. And I did not even know what viscous was. And I had a major, you know, like a major shift in my mentality where I realized, you know what, I am the consumer too. Even though my nation is a small nation, we are consumers also. We can make better buying decisions. And I was very encouraged to see companies like, you know, different kinds of companies coming together and being able to offer those products uh, in the North. And for us, with the work that we're doing with the land management uh, and planning on resource development and resource management in our territory, I think that's important, where we've identified the amount of impact that we have and where that impact will be directed. You know, that for me is the very important part because being the indigenous, uh, you know, representative talking about before this global awakening happened, it was very natural and normal to me to grow up in a forest that was perfectly symmetrical trees, row by row, that were very beautiful and green and, you know, uh, went up and came down on a cycle. And I only realized when I went to areas in my territory that were completely old growth, the absolute difference in what a true intact forest was. And there did I really finally understand the impact of sourcing. And for me, I think that's one of, one of the big lessons that we've learned in the Cree Nation over the past 30, 40 years of dealing with industry being present in our territory is seeing it, you know, slowly creep up north and trying to fight it, trying to prepare for it. You know, like we have to be honest with ourselves. We're not all, you know, activists fighting at the front lines. There, there are instances where we're engaged. We have to have discussions. And that's the reality of First Nations across Canada. There are some that are hosting events where they're trying to have discussion, they're trying to have dialogue, and then there's some that are fighting tooth and nail on the front lines in very you know, intense situations that are high conflict. And that's the spectrum of what First Nations are enduring in Canada. But the sourcing and the impact is all similar. So for me, the work that we've been doing with land management, really having that time to reflect on the where these products are being sold to and understanding the engagement in the marketplace was a very interesting story for us to tell in our land management stories, in our land management process also. It became another 
another element of the story that we were sharing. Mm -hmm. I, I think you spoke about the, the clear difference between intact old growth forests and um, you know forests that have been logged and replanted. And I think that's one of the major misconceptions um, that many um, tissue manufacturers and, and other manufacturers that use boreal wood products like to um, say is that you know because they replant a tree or several that that makes up for the fact that they're encroaching on these intact areas that are people's homes and um, I, I did want to just say point to the images that we have behind us today we um, we had somebody go up and take some photos of the boreal and um, you know it, it obviously pales in comparison to Mandy's experience and uh, um, her descriptions but it gives you a glimpse of you know a healthy intact forest and how lush it is and diverse and and a clear cut um, and it, to me, these images are really, really striking and illustrative of the of the problems that um, are happening, uh, the the challenges we face in the boreal. Um, I did. Well, and oh, Shelley, can I just add that I I don't know that everyone knows the scale of the problem, um, and I and I and I think that that's really important. I mean, since two thousand, um, they we've seen eighty million acres of forest loss um, in in Canada. That's massive. That's 11% of, 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 global, uh, of global loss. And, and you know, certainly a significant amount of that is because of uh, forests, fires, um, and other disturbances. But over a third of that is a result of industrial logging um, at, at an incredible scale and in places where it just shouldn't be happening, where we know um, it's the most critical habitat or the most biodiverse ha habitat. Yeah, and, and in the last 15 years, an area the size of Ohio has been clear cut in, in the boreal uh, for for a, a for U.S. A audience. <laughs> we, for Canadians, we say uh, we we like to talk about it's seven NHL hockey rinks a, a minute. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it's massive, and I I also think that. Um, People kind of assume that because it's Canada, um, there are better protections in place, and so um, that putting it in context um, really underscores the fact that we can't ignore our neighbors to the north, and uh, we need to make sure that um, you know the the marketplace that is driving this destruction does far far more. Um, Jeff, you have um, recently um, joined Audubon Society and you've been working to build the Boreal Conservation Program. Um, I heard you also speaking to Mandy earlier about how you can um, uh, amplify the work that she's doing. Can you share a little bit about you know, what you're focusing on right now and what Audubon, how Audubon has been contributing to this? Sure, yeah, I, I just... Uh came on with the National Audubon Society f uh, to bring a new boreal conservation program to them just in May. So we're still a little bit early in, in this whole process. But um, one of the things that Audubon is particularly excited about is the opportunity to, as, as Shelley just said, and as I was talking about with Mandy, is amplifying um, the, the voices for conservation uh, across the boreal, uh, whether it's highlighting um, indigenous-led land use planning, protected areas work, conservation work, uh, stewardship work, um, uh, science, um, a, a lot of the issues that are out there, um, bringing it to the, the audience of the tens of millions of birders that are across the U.S. and, of, uh, and, and the people who care about the environment um, in, in the U.S. And, and internationally and just trying to use a lot of the, the resources that Audubon has to try to be uh, among those that are trying to really amplify those voices, which of course is uh, something that then can be used as leverage at the, both the political and and business uh, level to try to influence uh, uh, governments and and industry to do th the right things and um, 
you know, I think most of us here know know the power of that. So um, it's something that that we think we can we can contribute, and we're also looking for for some other ways to to come alongside to collaborate with uh, indigenous communities who are doing the biggest land conservation uh, actions in in the world right now in the boreal forest. Um, you know, those of us in the U.S. who are uh, historians of conservation think of you know the the Roosevelt years and you know protecting the very large landscapes of the West. But right now, that same sort of thing's happening uh, with indigenous governments and communities across the boreal forest, and the world needs to know about it. Needs to know about those models, and we need to be supporting them. So we're trying to find some ways to help support their work and support some of the science um, that is is necessary for, for that as well. Great, great. That's awesome. Um, well, I I want to give the audience uh, a chance to ask some questions, but before I do that, I did want to give you all a, a chance to offer you know the, uh, your last thoughts and um, particularly thoughts on what people in the audience can do. Um, I think we have people here who are individuals. We also have companies and institutions who um, make t purchasing decisions on a larger scale. Um, so, you know, if you can share one, one thing that you think people in this room should um, do, that would be Fantastic. And why don't we start with Mandy? <laughs> Just one thing. <laughs> um, for me, I think it really speaks to the comment that Jeff had made is creating that space for the indigenous voice because I find that that for me is missing. You know, like earlier this morning, I'm on one of the previous panels I participated one of the women there told me I spoke at the UN and our panel had just been thrown together that morning. You know, like if you really think about it, there it's a level of government that is taking decisions that will impact so many individuals that live in harmony in the front lines of the forest that are directly impacted in their lifestyle and their ability to practice their culture have food sources, have clean water, yet their voices are not even invited to be a part of that dialogue. And to me, that is a very backwards approach to trying to save a planet. When you've had these people that carry hundreds of thousands of years of knowledge, living in direct harmony and dependence on an environment, yet are not even asked to be part of the discussion hey, what can we do to improve the impact we're having on the planet? You know, that to me, if there's one thing I can advise people in the audience to do is to really create that space and invite Indigenous people to be part of the dialogue because it is our right as Indigenous people. And I think that the understanding that we have is unique. It is different. It is first-hand knowledge that has built that has been built upon generation after generation of direct living descendants. You know, my mother was born in the bush. That was only 60 years ago. My grandfather was born in the bush. He was a full-time hunter, fisher, trapper. And, you know, I can go down my family history of people that have lived directly in harmony with USG and that have, as every generation progresses, been impacted by it right down to my kids that are now hunting in these fake forests. And, you know, I think I was very strategic because I married a man from the north, the most northern, least impacted and developed portion of our territory. Uh, but to be able to access an undeveloped and be from a developed territory, it really opens my eyes to the changing landscape of the Cree territory. And even, I think, my role as a leader and we are all individual leaders. I know you said one, but I'm going to say two. Really doing a call to action for small, simple things. Small, simple things. You know, this year I was very proud that my nation launched, launched a challenge to ban styrofoam. Something that was just taken for granted that people used. It was cheap. It was, you know, lightweight and 
abundant, unfortunately, in our territory. And once we really had dialogue about, hey, do you know what that means for Iwishji, a beautiful, pristine territory that we, that we use, you are impacting it also. And really calling people out on their actions, I think, is part of it. You know, you have to do that as part of humankind. But to be part of humankind that represents Indigenous people, I think for me it is so important to, to ask them, please come and tell us what you see. Because unfortunately, fish don't talk, moose don't talk, caribou don't talk, but I really believe that Cree people and Indigenous people in Canada are blessed to have a voice on their behalf. So they have to be invited to those spaces. Thank you. The planet's also better off when, when you're... you're work is centered, so thank you. Um, Mike, what do you think? Um, well, I guess the one thing is uh, you know, stop wiping your rear with trees, right? That's, um, oh, I'll say two things too, but um, I, I guess to build on what Mandy was saying is that um, this can be, we can make this simple for consumers. Um, that we can tell stories uh, and make it really easy. So uh, it's really common for people to as associate like some, um, these challenges of becoming eco-friendly as, as a hard thing. Like it's always like, oh, let you know how are we gonna how are we gonna you know better our world? This must be really hard. And in some cases, of course, it is. But it but some things don't have to be. In fact, it can be fun. And so that's what we strive to do is to make it really easy for people to make one small change. I mean, technically, you know, to get our products, you don't even have to leave your house. We'll deliver it right to your door. Um, so if we make it fun and really bring a lot of value and tell a simple story, it can be easy to do good. Um, just uh, very um, simply at this moment um, for uh, this campaign, I would say um, don't buy uh, Charmin. Don't buy from Procter & Gamble and let them know why. They follow their social media. Let, help us spread the word. Um, tag them on Twitter. Um, go to their Facebook pages on Facebook. Let them know what you're deciding to do and about your concerns and ask other people too as well. Um, if you um, are Canadian, I also ask you to um, let your member of parliament um, know uh, that you care and that you expect um, them to ensure um, that there are recovery plans in place in line with the science and our legislation. And, and, I, and I'm just going to uh, sort of uh, follow up on, on a version of what everybody else said, I guess, but uh, kind of em embrace your your personal power to make change um, that could mean and it should mean doing something at your local level in your household like not buying products that are harmful to boreal forest um, and switching to a different buying it could mean doing something in your local community like getting your town uh, you know your town office town hall to switch their buying and it can mean um, trying to um, elect leaders who share your, your values and let them know what your values are. Sort of, I like to think we, we all should be doing sort of something at each level and being uh, with our with environmental groups that um, make it very easy to click a button to send a, 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 a an email to to somebody about an issue. There's ways you can you can do that very regularly and continuing to be doing that. So. I would say sort of embrace the power you have to make change and do it at all those levels um, and in the ways we just heard from, from everybody here. Great. Thank you so much. I um, want to turn it over to the audience and we have time for um, a few questions before, um, before refreshments. I think you're... No, I mean, having been, having been old enough with the, when the last wave of like when some of the toilet the recycled papers came out, the product wasn't absorbent, but it's fantastic. So there you go. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. 
We're back in stock. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this question is for Mike. Why is it that all toilet paper is not 100% recyclable? Well, I mean, a major as, as in the report, um, that was a lot of uh, toilet paper is made from virgin trees. And you're asking, like, why? why what's, why? what's harder about sourcing recycled paper, for instance? Or is it more expensive? Is it harder to make? Why, why is it that it's more difficult? Like, why doesn't everyone do it? Well, I, th I think uh, generally uh, part, part of the, the problem is just, like, practice. I mean, generally, it, we provide a product that's n very competitive to a lot of toilet paper brands. And I think, one, it has to do with, like, uh, like a, a established working processes. When you get to a really large organization, it, really, it gets harder to make huge changes in your supply chain. Um, so I think that... You know, we're as an emerging company. It's easier for us to almost. You know, we're starting from scratch, building our relationships with all of our producers, with our factories. Um, really being mindful of, of of how we control and make sure that what we're doing is responsible. Um, but I, I think part of it is is because no one's telling them not to. Um, so you know, when you get to a certain economy of scale, it gets it, the, it, a lot of it is based on price. Um, I think part of, part of what we would like to do is to uh, prove that there is more demand for a recyclable product, um, uh, and you know, we, and alternative products like bamboo, which we also offer, uh, making 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 sure that there's uh, choice, not only choice in the marketplace, but also like sustainable choices. Um, you know, people are willing to pay for a product that they know is good for the environment and and is enjoyable to use. Thank you very much, Ken. <laughs> um, but I, I think part of it has to do with the scale. Uh, and like where the demand is coming from. Uh, again, you can see that a lot of companies, it's not like value comes in a lot of places. Um, there's value in storytelling and there is value in brand and what that, what that represents. So, and, and so when you shift the demand, that's not just based on how something is made, like there's, there's so much going into it, right? Um, and there, these, these changes have happened before in other industries. Um, in large industries, so I think that's we're trying to um, to to be a, a good influence, you know, as a competitor in the marketplace. Um, yeah. um, so one of the things that Procter and Gamble has been claiming is that they have to use trees and they can't use recycled fiber because um, they have a special softness technology that requires a specific length of fiber. I think is their argument. Um, uh, first, a historical point and then a point on the softness. The historical point is that when we campaigned to get um, Home Depot uh, not to be using old growth wood on its shelves from the heart of the Amazon or the heart of the Great Bear Rainforest, um, they said it wasn't possible, that they couldn't figure it, you know, we, we couldn't track the chain of custody. We did. They became the first company to have good rules about where their wood um, came from in the world. Victoria's Secret said they couldn't make catalogs from recycled paper or do more catalogs online. Um, you know, 3M told us it wasn't possible um, to make sticky notes that weren't made from 100% um, uh, virgin fibers. Of course, all these things are possible. Um, these companies are big. They have the capacity to change the way that paper is made in the world. Um, on the softness uh, question, um, uh, Stand.Earth uh, Earth um, launched a its own test. Um, we have been doing videos, um, interviews with customers across the country and especially um, at Procter & Gamble events. And um, we, I think it's called Mr. Softy. Is that the name of the... It's a blind wipe test um, that we have, um, uh, that we video and we go into supermarkets and in front of events and we ask people if they will close their eyes and test different toilet papers on their this cheek, not that cheek. <laughs> and, um, and in fact, um, the results have been absolutely hilarious and you can watch the videos online, some of them and starting to go a little viral. Um, just check out Stand Out Earth's campaign and, with, and, and the fact is, um, the majority of the people has, can see no difference. So this idea that they have, that's, it's a marketing angle for them. Um, and um, their marketing angle should be that they're going to find a way um, uh, to make a better product by doing the right thing in the world at this moment in history. 
Um, and that's what will happen um, once they feel uh, enough pressure. Thank you. I have to sneak another question in really quick. Do you look at regenerative tree farms as a negative or a positive in this fight? Well, I, I think it, it depends how we define regenerative. Um, and so um, we're not here saying that there should be no logging. Mm -hmm. Should there be whole trees used to make tissue paper? Mm -hmm. That's really another question. And we're encouraging companies to increase their use of recycled fiber, post-consumer fiber, um, et cetera, in order to make toilet paper, do we still need um, logging uh, for wood and paper in the world? We don't, unfortunately, yet have a circular economy. We should, um, but we don't. And so we do um, need some logging. How that logging happens and where it happens is very important. Um, so uh, we're working um, uh, to support uh, the Forest Stewardship Council, which is probably the best certification system for logging that we have. Um, but there are still problems with it, quite frankly. Um, because we don't have the conservation that we need to protect endangered species like caribou, even some FSE certified logging is not good enough. Um, and in terms of regenerative tree plantations, I would say, and then I'll pass it over to the expert over here, um, that um, we need to ensure um, that we are um, uh, trying to um, mimic what we learned from nature. Uh, that we have um, variable age, that we have variable species, that we are maintaining or enhancing what used to be old growth or primary characteristics uh, and in order to ensure um, that we have diversity uh, on, on the planet. So um, should there be huge swaths of tree farms? In some places that makes more sense, for example, in the south where it grows faster, um, and it's different landscapes um, in the boreal forest. Actually, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, but this person knows a hundred times more than me. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, I, I mean, you. I, I don't think I have anything to add. You, <laughs> you, you covered the basis on it. But I mean, there, there. Are, when you get into tree, tree farming or tree planting, depending on how you're defining it, and tropical regions versus northern regions, it's a, it's got all sorts of intricacies, which. You know, probably you, you touched on a lot of them, but, um, but you know, including things like replacing native grasslands in parts of South America with, with, with uh, you know, tree plantations, which is not a good thing either. So there, there's a lot of intricacies to it. Um, Thank you all. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I just want to, I want to speak to your question too, because I think it's really important you know, like I said, indigenous voice needs to be part of the discussion. And for me, regenerative tree planting and forestry are not good for us. You know, maybe for the industry, maybe for developing a product, but for First Nations, no. You cannot replant and capture the original landscape that Chemindu has created for, for Aboriginal, you know, territories. And I think that even to think on any scale that you could do so is foolish thinking on your part that you could regenerate a forest. I know like with approaches in trying to do mixed sand forestry, you are capturing a component, of it, a component of it, but you can never achieve original intact old growth forest and the variety and bounty of life in those areas. So you really have to question yourself the purpose of regenerative forestry and who is it serving. But for me as an indigenous person, absolutely not in any context. Well, and, and, I, and I think the point, if I'm getting you right, Mandy, that you're making is, is, is that you, it, it can't replace uh, existing old growth or primary or intact forests. I mean, there are, yeah. Is that, yeah, then I, I think that's really important because then what are the rules for a landscape where we're, we're planting that don't have forests now? Because honestly, on climate solutions, we need to be planting as much forest as we can at this moment in history because we need trees to be sucking carbon out of the atmosphere. But we should be doing that and we should be not destroying the existing older and intact forests that are left. Right. Or native grasslands. Right. Yeah. I s another question? Or Hello, um, I'm Deborah Lapidus with Mighty Earth, um, and thank you so much for your really important work. We work around the world to stop deforestation and run corporate campaigns, so if there's any way we can help, I'm very happy to do so. Uh, just on that last topic, I wanted to point out that uh, you probably already know this, but the Chief Sustainability Officer for 
Procter & Gamble is going to be speaking at an event on forest restoration on Thursday uh, from 4 to 6. So that could be a really great opportunity to bring out the 60-foot toilet paper roll. Um, Can we get that here? I, I, I don't know if it's already on your radar, but it just seems ironic that they would be obviously talking about restoring forests rather than preserving the virgin forests that remain. So a good opportunity. Um, and then I guess my question is just building on some of the things you were saying, Sephora. Um, I thought Greenpeace reached a victory, like a victory with Kimberly Clark on their campaign a long time ago and following the other campaigns on Victoria's Secret and the mail order catalogs. Um, I guess I'm just wondering what happened with those victories. Did the companies walk back their commitments, and why 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 does this problem persist for so long? Well, so I'm going to say one thing generally about the markets campaigns, Victoria's Secret, and then maybe I'll turn it over to you for specifics on Kimberly Clark because I don't know. Um, uh, but so when we reached uh, what we thought was an agreement with the logging industry um, and um, on um, a moratorium on logging caribou habitat. Um, while indigenous protected areas and conservation proposals came forward and we worked with scientists and indigenous communities to ensure greater protection in the area, we stopped the markets campaigns because that was the agreement. They would stop logging, we would stop the boycott campaigns, and then conservation would come into play uh, through these processes across the country. Um, but the logging companies um, uh, kept logging. And, and because we don't have thousands of people across the country, you know, they're logging in very remote places and we didn't know and we didn't have the mapping and the et cetera to know where they were. And so it came to light over the past, was it five years ago that you started? Five years, over the past five years that there's significant logging happening right inside critical caribou habitat areas. Um, and, um, you know, the markets campaign has been, um, you know, kind of increasing speed again. Um, and we're starting to look at not only, well, we'll continue the campaign on Procter & Gamble, but also looking at um, uh, other potential uh, sectors, et cetera. Um, because the, quite frankly, the financial and political pressure is necessary in order to raise this to the top of the agenda. And so, um, but we really wanted to operate in good faith. We wanted to use the power and the pressure to create a solution space. Um, and when they signed the Canadian Boreal Forest Agreement saying that they wouldn't log in critical caribou habitat, we believed them. And I... Kimberly Clark, did you want yeah, to answer? Yeah, and I, um, I can answer your question about Kimberly Clark. NRDC was actually part of that campaign, um, you know, 10 years ago as well. And um, we were able to get because of our corporate campaigning, we were able to get Kimberly Clark to make a commitment to reduce its virgin forest or its uh, natural forest fiber by 50% by 2025. And um, they are on their way to meeting that. Um, they also have uh, close to 25% of their total fiber comes from alternative and recycled sources. That's the good news. The bad news is that none of that is going into at-home tissue products. And um, we're still working with them to change that. And we're, one of the reasons that we're pushing Procter & Gamble is they don't have any commitment about their tissue fiber. Um, but it is so absurd in today's day and age that you go to the supermarket and chances are you won't see a product that isn't made from 100% virgin forest fiber. Um, and, you know, that's, that's why we have to still keep fighting. Um, before I wrap up, were there any other? Yeah, I just, this, this drove around with NRDC also, but I just I wanted to go back to a point that Mandy made, which is about the importance of indigenous-led efforts, because I think part of the reason that maybe the environmental groups have not been successful in the long term with some of these agreements is that you really need your partners on the ground. I mean, to have the indigenous-led protection that Mandy is working on, for example, in Iwishti, I have no doubt that if Mandy strikes a deal with the Quebec government for her 30% protection, it's going to be there mm -hmm. in 30 years because she's going to make sure, and the people that are there on the ground, the Cree communities are going to make sure. So, Mandy, I wanted to turn it over to you to maybe have the last word about how that could bring about a different future for these kind of campaigns because Sapor and I have been at this for... 30 years, right? I first met Sapporo in the blockade in Clackwood Sound 
in 1992, and um, we don't have that kind of time left. So, you know, your your voice. Now there were Native voices that were incredibly powerful in that campaign, but your your ability to help us. And I'm sorry that we have to come to you and ask this at this point, given everything that's been done to your land. But I think you have such a powerful role in changing the direction um, of what's happened because you are there, um, and it is your land and your future, and it's our future as well because of what you can do to help us um, do things differently. Thank you, Liz. I think, um, you know, it's really come to the forefront of the attention of the general public that the voice of the Indigenous people in Canada should be elevated, should be louder. And I was very disappointed to see that you know, this past year, our own government did not pass the United Declarations for Indigenous People. You know, championed by one of the most well, rec the most recognized members of Parliament, Romeo Saignash, who built his career on fighting for the rights of the Cree and the rights of Indigenous people in Canada. Yet that was not passed in Parliament. That was so disappointing for me, not because it was failed to achieve because there was a failure to recognize the importance of the indigenous voice in the Canadian context and in any landscape. So that's why when I say create space for the indigenous voice, for the person that's living in a thousand kilometer away community that has no road access or does not have access to internet or running water or paved streets, these people can speak to you of the direct impact that they feel in their daily lives. I'm sure it's the same thing for the United States. Having indigenous people come and speak for themselves, and I think that Liz will you know, back me up when I say one of the things that I was very adamant in working with our NGOs was, we will tell our story. We need you to hold the space, but we have the voice to tell our story. And that's something that I think Indigenous people have to take ownership of, you know. We've endured a lot, we've gone through many things, but we have to take ownership of the fact that we have the right and we have the, you know, the, the responsibility to tell our story and you make use of the networks and the partnerships and the support of groups that want us to tell that story. So I really appreciate that you made that comment, Liz. I know that I was very adamant with Liz and she really respected that. And I think that's something that's of importance to Indigenous people throughout Canada and the US, that we have these stories to tell that relate to you. It's not an Indian problem. That's only for us. We are keepers of the land and water and air that you breathe. So invite us to help and be part of it. Thank you so much. And thank you um, to all of the panelists today. Um, I, it, you were incredible. Um, and I just to close before we um, have some refreshments uh, for you all, uh, I wanted to end by noting that, um, you know, as we've talked about, as it's come up several times during this panel, um, the times are changing really quickly. And as um, Greta Thunberg said yesterday, we are the world's leaders and corporations are failing youth and they're failing indigenous communities um, by not taking bold and drastic action uh, to address the climate emergency. And it is no longer acceptable to uh, for companies to continue with the status quo and provide meek excuses for not making transformative change. Um, and I hope that from today's panel, you took away that even your tissue products, which you probably didn't think have a significant impact, do uh, affect the global climate and, um, and the world's forests. And I also hope that you leave with some ideas of how you as an individual, you as a representative of an institution, you as a uh, manu manufacturer can incorporate changes into your purchasing decisions and sourcing. Um, we come at this from a lot of different angles and it is going to take a lot of work and a lot of work really quickly in order to 
save the planet. And all of us up here are in that fight together, um, and we hope that you'll join us. Thank you.